Hey, um, I can't believe Thanksgiving is just a couple weeks away. Can you? I hope you guys will come out for a night of Thanksgiving. It's, gonna, it's always a wonderful time of testimony, and this year we're throwing baptism into the mix, so it'll be a time of celebration, and there's always good food falling. So I uh, look forward to seeing you guys. Just want to draw your attention real quick um, to these prayer cards that are out, in the, um, out at the help desk. Um, this week, several people have, have suffered loss, and, and Donna, I see you, Donna McGuire, I've been praying for you at the loss of your father this week, and, and services are tomorrow, correct, down at Pinehurst, so you'll be in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, George Mammon, uh, his father passed away, it may be over a week now, or right around a week ago in India, so we've been praying for him. Um, several people have been um, just really battling with cancer. Patrick Lee, we want to continue to pray for Patrick. Um, hospice has been called in for Pat, uh, Patsy Ritter's father and uh, also for Benny Devers. And so we need to just lift one another up. There's other needs on here. There's surgeries and, and whatnot. Let's be the body of Christ to one another and um, just pray for one another. You know, can we do that? Larry, we've been praying for your nephew and um, so many needs, but our God is able. For those of you that may be your first time or you don't know who I am, I'm, I'm Pastor Tom. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the church and Pastor David is, is uh, preaching for his brother-in-law in Florida today as he finishes uh, his vacation, be coming back in Tuesday night, be with us on Wednesday. So he will be in the pulpit next Sunday. I'm counting on it anyways. <laughs> Two times in one month, I mean, whew. <clears throat> All right. Well, ready or not, here I come. I've got just a little bit of something going on there. Um, Joey, if you could help me with that a little bit, a little bit of ringing. Ready or not, here I come. Those are words of warning, aren't they? Those are words of warning that cause little children to squeal with delight and to give away their hiding place. You know what I'm talking about? You, those of you kids have grown up, you remember when they were little and playing hide and seek? I love that age. Ready or not, then you hear... You knew exactly where to go. Of course, you didn't go right away. You know, you kind of went everywhere around, and you, you know, and you find them. Words of warning. Well, these words have also been echoing in my soul, as deep calls to deep. Ready or not, here I come. Over the past year, I have been enjoying a an app, a Bible app on my phone. And I have been listening my way through the Bible. You guys remember when you used to be able to do that with cassettes? <laughs> what was it, like a 30-pack volume or something like that, you know? Took 30 cassettes. Well, all it takes is a little Wi-Fi or cellular, and, you know, you can listen to the Bible. And so I've been doing that, and I found it's a better alternative while driving to the same old, same old on the radio. You know what I'm talking about? You can tune in three months from now, and someone will be killing somebody, and somebody will have cheated somebody, and, you know, uh, it's the same old, same old. I think it was Solomon, wasn't it, who said there's nothing new under the sun. I love it when you hear some of these old songs, you know, the teenagers are listening to. They're new songs to them, but they're just remakes of what my parents listen to or what I listen to. Same old, same old, recycled. I've been able to listen to entire books of the Bible when I've gone on some long walks, and that has been really interesting because, you know, I can read for about 30 minutes or so, and then I don't know about you, but I mean, these don't help me anymore, and I get a little tired and that, but, but I can go on a four-mile walk, and for an hour, hour and a half, just the Word of God, just listening to... Uh, you get into like First Peter, Second. I mean, you can listen to book after book after book. It's amazing, and it's it's really different when you listen to the Bible. 
and it's in, like that versus when you're reading it. Because I find when I read it, I tend to, something will hit me and my mind will stop right there on the page and I'll, I'll think about it and I'll dwell on that. And, and sometimes I don't catch the whole flavor and the whole context of the letter or, or what, what the uh, apostle is saying. And so as I've been listening my way through, one theme surfaced again and again, book after book. And that theme is Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming again. And so in preparation for this message, I did a little research, and I found that there are 318 references to the Lord's return in 23 of 27 of the books in the New Testament. 318 references just in the New Testament. There are hundreds of other Old Testament references from the likes of Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Job, and nearly all the prophets. And this one, this one really got me. For every one reference to Christ's birth, there are eight references to his return. For every one prophecy, every one Bible reference to Christ's birth, you can find eight other references to his return. Every New Testament author, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, Jude, Paul, and whoever the writer of Hebrews was, every one of them wrote about Jesus' second coming. In fact, Jesus spoke with his disciples in some detail about his return. So much so that this not only shaped the disciples' faith, but it led them to action that the Bible describes as turning the world upside down. When people realize that Jesus is coming again, and they understand the impact of his return, it causes them to live their lives in a different manner than before. And so this morning I want us to talk about this. I want us to think about this. I want us to listen to what the Bible has to say, not in 318 references, but in one passage. I want us to focus our attention on 2 Peter chapter 3. And for those of you that have paper Bibles this morning, I'll give you a chance to turn there. I would remind you this about Peter. Peter was an eyewitness to Jesus ascending into heaven. And as he stood there with the other disciples looking up, you remember two men looked like angels appeared. And they asked him, what are you guys doing? What are you, what are you standing there looking? For this same Jesus will return in like manner. Jesus was an eyewitness. Now listen to his words. Second Peter. Second Peter 3. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. 
Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 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 Ready or not, Jesus is coming. Ready or not, the Lord will return. This is a foundational truth to our Christian faith. It cannot be ignored. It cannot be overlooked. Yes, Peter said there'll be scoffers. Just accept the fact that when you profess this truth, some will ridicule and laugh. But don't let them trouble you. Peter says, don't let them trouble you. He reveals their heart. They are sinful, filled with evil desires. They will try to undermine our faith based on the fact that Jesus has not yet returned. They remind me of those who scoffed at Noah. Remember when Noah was building the ark? There were those who ridiculed him, who made fun of him. Why, they had never witnessed rain capable of flooding the earth. Let me tell you something about people who doubt the promise of God. They are like children playing on train tracks, completely unaware of what's coming around the bend. Peter also reminds us and reveals what's in their head. They're ignorant. In their minds, they deliberately forget what God has done. Our universe exists not because of a big bang. Our universe exists because God spoke it into being. Psalms 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens, made, the heavens were made, the starry host, by the breath of his mouth. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the starry host, by the breath of his mouth. By his word, God formed the earth. By his word, God created man. By his word, the rain fell and the flood waters rose. By his word, destruction and judgment will come upon heaven and earth. Just because we mere mortals have never witnessed an event doesn't mean it won't happen. God is faithful in keeping his word. You can take that to the bank. God is faithful in keeping his promises. It shall come to pass. 
We're also reminded that God is not affected by time. Peter said in verse 8, With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And so if Jesus walked this earth some 2,000 years ago, to the Lord it's like Friday? <laughs> Two days ago? I, I hear what Peter's saying, but I can't get my mind around it. I cannot figure out how time works. I mean, it's ironic how beholden we are to tracking time. We live our lives by time. Machinery runs by time. Computers run by time. We, time is so important to us, and yet we have no idea when time began. Nor can we tell you when time will end. We can't comprehend eternity past any more than we can comprehend eternity future. All I know is God is the one who holds time in his hand. God himself is timeless. He does not exist within time. He supersedes it. He's God. And verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. God, you're late. You're running slow. You're not on time. No, God doesn't operate that way. Peter says instead, he's not slow, he's patient. He's patient with us. God takes no delight in anyone going to a hell created for Satan and his minions. But rather, God is willing to wait, to be patient, that all should repent and find salvation in his Son. And so during this age of grace, God is patient. He waits. But make no mistake, his patience is only for a season. And then suddenly, that fast, the Lord will return as a thief in the night. I need to call a time out. I was going to get a whistle and blow it here, but. I just need to take a, can I take a theological huddle? Can I call a timeout and just, can we huddle together, a little theological huddle for a minute? Timeouts don't last long, okay? So just bear with me, all right? For 2,000 years, Christians have been waiting and longing for the return of Jesus. This is our blessed hope, or the second coming, which is different from the day of the Lord, and it precedes the day of the Lord. Think of it this way. The second coming of Jesus is the Lord coming for his saints. This is the rapture of the church. The day of the Lord is the Lord returning with his saints and the angels to rule the earth and usher in those end time, ultimately the day of judgment. Okay, are you with me so far? Second coming of Jesus. Returning for his saints. The day of the Lord. Returning with the saints and the angels. Most theologians agree upon the sequence of events, but not the timing, as the first event relates to the second. When will Jesus first appear? This is the age-old question that no one knows for certain. To further add to the mystery, you've got New Testament writers interchanging these two phrases. And that causes people today to disagree over end-time events. Because we don't have the benefit of being there as this was all unpacked. We have letters. We have part. We understand in part. Let me just take, let me take for example, Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians where he is clearly addressing the return of Christ for his saints. 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul speaks about the coming of Jesus. First, for those who are dead in Christ, they will be resurrected. And second, for those who are alive, 
They will be transformed in the blink of an eye. And it says, together they will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. And then Paul immediately says, he doesn't need to write about when this will happen, and I quote, For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He does this again in 2 Thessalonians 2. Concerning the coming of Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by, a, by the teaching allegedly from us, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. You see, in both of these passages, Paul's not talking about the great and terrible day of the Lord when Christ comes with judgment. But rather, as the writer of Hebrew puts it, when Jesus will appear a second time to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Regardless of your view of the timing of these events, whether Christ is going to come before the tribulation period, in the middle of the tribulation period, after the tribulation, regardless of the timing I believe we can agree there is coming a day when suddenly everything going on around us will come to a halt. And with a loud voice and the trumpet call of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords will reappear on the world stage. Can we agree on that? Jesus is coming. He's coming again. And when he does, everything will change. I want you to note a few things about his appearance. It will be sudden and unexpected. Peter said it would be like a thief in the night. Paul said the same thing, and he went on to describe it in 1 Thessalonians 5 too. This is what's going to go on when Jesus returns. You want to know what it's going to be like? When people are saying, Everything is peaceful and secure. Then disaster will fall upon them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin. And there will be no escape. I love the story. Those of you that have been around long enough, you may remember Pastor telling the story of being in the delivery room with Sherry. And I don't remember, I want to say it's with their firstborn, Ashley. Okay, so can you picture this? Those of you that know precious, sweet, innocent Sherry, okay, in the delivery room, and as the labor pains intensified, Sherry looked up at David and said, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I, I can hear her saying that, knowing her so well. Oh, David, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I bet that thought's crossed the mind of a lot of women in labor. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here right now. But there's no escaping it, is there? Such will be the day when the Lord returns. No one can escape it. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 23, If the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So Christ's return will be sudden and unexpected, and it will be catastrophic. See, Jesus went on to say in verse 29, The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies, bodies will be shaken. And Peter stated, The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Right after I graduated from college, I spent a summer internship at Granite City, Illinois. Anybody know where that's at? 
It's right across the river from St. Louis. Joe, you know. Do you know what Grant, Grant City, Illinois was famous for? What? <laughs> yeah, you know why I was there, but the city was made famous for its steel production back in our industrial heyday. Granite City still. And there were a couple guys at the church. Back then I thought they were, you know, kind of old guys, but <laughs> about my age now. <clears throat> they worked at the steel mill. And one day I had the opportunity to, to go down there, and I got to watch from a distance as iron and carbon and other elements were heated in this huge vat until they became liquid steel. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's amazing. And even from a distance, the fire and the heat were so intense. But that experience cannot compare to the fire of God that is coming one day to destroy every element in this universe. You see, nothing, no one, will escape his judgment. Everything is coming under his judgment. So Peter asks a rhetorical question in verse 11. Knowing that the judgment is coming, how then ought we to live? Knowing these things in advance, how should we live our lives? Should we live with despair? Anxiety? Should we live in fear? Or should we just throw up our hands and say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die? No. Peter answers his own question. He says, we are to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Live holy and godly lives, making every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. When Jesus returns. Paul admonished the Corinthian believers to put away childish things and to grow up into maturity in Christ. And I, I never really saw that in the context before that he was, he, was doing, he was saying these things because if you look at the chapters before and you look at the chapter where he says that and you look at the chapter that follows, He's right in the middle, these three chapters, of dealing with problems in the church. Problems in the church. And right in the middle of dealing with the problems in the church, he talks about perfecting love in our hearts for one another. The love chapter in Corinthians. Living holy and godly starts here with our brothers and sisters. Not out there in the world. It starts here. And it isn't about pointing fingers at others in the church, but it starts with standing in the mirror and looking at the imperfections in our own lives and making every effort to change and be more like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to ask God to give us a deep love for one another, especially for those brothers and sisters we tend to struggle with. For as Peter says, Love covers a multitude of sins. Can I just be real with you for a moment? Because my personality and my constant striving, I don't know, it's not really striving for perfection, it's more like a glitch. I just work things to death over and over, trying to just get things just, it's, it's my nature. I'm a beaver. <laughs> Those of you who know the four personality types, I'm, I am an ultimate beaver. And when I take eyes that are critical and judgmental on things, and I look at people, and look at people critically, I tend to judge them. I know nobody else in here does that, but let me just be real with you. It's hard for me not to look with judgmental eyes. I have to ask God, because I do, I catch myself, and I have to ask God to help me see people through eyes of love. 
And when I see with love, I see Christ in my brothers and sisters. I see beyond the imperfections. I see beyond the flaws. I see beyond the sins. Because love covers a multitude of sins as we look upon others. That's the context for that scripture. Love covers a multitude of sins. So as you look and as you struggle with that brother and sister, if you will look at them through the eyes of love, Christ's love, you'll find love will cover a multitude of sins. Grace abounds. It's a beautiful thing. But if you find you are the one struggling with a particular sin in your life, the Bible says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Run with perseverance the race God has called you to. That's what repentance is. It's casting down, just laying aside the sin and running hard in the opposite direction toward those things that are holy and godly. With each passing day, time grows shorter, doesn't it? We are becoming closer and closer to the Lord's return. We must be done with lesser things and do the work God has called us to do. Scripture teaches to work while it's still day, for night comes when no one can work. Isn't it a sobering thing to think that all of your work on earth is going to be tested by fire? All your work will be judged by fire. All that we have aspired to obtain, the American dream to own a home, to amass possession, and to accumulate wealth so we can retire in luxury, all will be consumed with nothing to show for it. I find in reading Paul's letter to Timothy, there are two things of value that we can take from this life to the next. Two things, he says. The first one is godliness. Godliness will follow you in this life to the next. The second is good works. Godliness and good works, those endure to the end. Godliness is being like Jesus and living holy. Good works is doing like Jesus and doing the will of God. As you commit yourself to being like Jesus, His holiness and His righteousness, it covers you. It covers you like a garment and keeps you spotless and blameless. And as you're doing good works, that keeps you at peace with God. It's wonderful how godliness and good works tie in to what Peter is saying. And then there's one last thing to consider in light of everything that's going to happen. In light of everything that's going to be destroyed, Peter said you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. I used to just pass right over that. That phrase, speed its coming. In your Bible, it might be translated hastening the coming or hurrying it along. Have you ever thought, how can I speed up the return of Christ? How in the world can I hasten his return? Matthew 24, 14 holds the key. Jesus said, in this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Just prior to that, he talked about all the signs that would precede that. All the signs of what, that we're in the last days, or we're nearing the last days. People being anxious. Aren't people anxious about financial markets? Anybody in here? Are you anxious about the financial markets? Are you concerned? Are you anxious about what's going on in the world governments? Wars and rumors of wars? People are worried about ISIS. People are worried about Ebola. They're worried about so many things, just like Jesus predicted. And he also said, in those days, everything will be going on as in the days of Noah. People will eat, drink, and marry and give and marry. 
and live completely unaware that the Son of Man is coming. But the end will not yet come. The end will not come until the gospel has been proclaimed throughout the earth. And so let's do our part in speeding up his return. Let's help fulfill the Great Commission, praying for the lost, sharing our stories of faith, giving to missions and ministries, going wherever we can with whomever we can. If you are able to go on one of our short-term missions trips, go. Go. Everybody can do something to hasten the day of his return. As we prepare to receive communion, brothers and sisters that are going to be serving, would you get ready? As we prepare the Lord's Supper, Paul said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Let me ask you this this morning. Are you living with an awareness that he's coming soon? Are you ready for the impact of his return? Are you living a godly life? Are you doing what you can to speed up his return? Ready or not, he's coming. He's coming.